guys so much for being here. I want to start by introducing each of us and the conversation. Uh, as you know, I'm Kristen Messerly, founder of Cultural Outreach, and I work with lenders and companies in reaching young and diverse markets. And one of the biggest ways that we do that is through nonprofit partnerships and community relationships, community outreach. So that's why today I wanted to bring you guys to the table to have a discussion about how we do that effectively. Uh, we have two of the top lenders in reaching diverse markets and two of the top nonprofits in the country working with companies in reaching underserved markets. So, um, so yeah, I'm just excited to have you guys here and ask you a few questions so we can get to know each other and some of the strategies that each of you are seeing from your companies. On the lender side, we have the SVP Manager of Diverse Lending Sales, James McDuffie, who has led First Citizens Bank to successful growth in diverse markets. And he is the winner of the Large Institution Market Outreach Award by the MBA. Uh, and then we also have Jesus Neri, who is a top producer and leader in Hispanic and social media marketing, uh, representing Altera Home Loans, who's also the winner of the Small to Medium Size Market Outreach Awards by the MBA. On the nonprofit side, I'm proud to introduce two exceptional nonprofits who are working with lenders and other companies as community partners. First, I'll introduce Jessica Reed, who is the Senior Director of Corporate and Foundation Engagement for Rebuilding Together, which partners with com community members and institutions to provide home repairs to those in need across the country. We also have a, with us Milan Griffin, who is the VP of Marketing and Outreach for Home Free USA, which partners with some of the largest lenders across the country to provide home readiness counseling, among other services, to increase sustainable homeownership in underserved markets. So thank you all for being here. And to open it up, I want to, you all do very interesting and meaningful work, so I want each of you to introduce a little bit more about what your day-to-day -day role looks like and um, how you got into this industry. So we'll start with you, start James. With me. Yeah. <laughs> all right. My day-to-day -day role is really to um, ensure that our bank is positioned properly in the communities and properly serving all the ones that exist in our markets, which are from a diverse uh, capacity to economic capacity with some of our CRA programs. And so I lead the strategies and a team of a dedicated team of loan officers to ensure that we have the right partners and the right relationships and doing the right business uh, to ensure the entire community gets addressed holistically by our bank. That's my role. Uh, what got me here, uh, I'm an engineer by degree, uh, spent plenty of years in software development, but then got into banking. When I got into banking, I got into mortgage. I was a loan officer. And I learned early on that what was near and dear to me was the part of the business that really impacted lives. You're looking at uh, giving people hope uh, to have their first home. I remember I had pies baked for me. I've had, they wanted to name children after me. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's really the impact that you're having on people's lives. It's really that big. And it really won me over. And so I went from a loan officer into a uh, capacity that really focused on ensuring that not just me, as an individual, but the institutions that I work for also have a focus in that space. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what drills me into the role that I'm in now. Amazing. That's great. Jesus, what about you? So um, I think I'll take a little bit of a liberty and say that I don't think any of us go into this industry thinking that we're going to be loan officers. Um, I know for me, when I was a kid growing up, I thought um, I had it pretty much mapped out. I was going to be an astronaut, a marine biologist, and Superman. <laughs> I thought that was it, you know? And then reality strikes, right? So then you start looking into different fields of, of um, you know, what you're going to do. And for me, um, my mom's an attorney by trade. So then, you know, naturally you're going to take over that, you know? But I didn't really like being in school, and I wanted a career that could um, yield the same type of income, right? So for me, it was pretty selfish that I wanted to find something like that. And then I started like really diving into my career. And then I realized that it wasn't a career as much as it was a vocation. This is a calling that we're in. Because what we, you start to realize is that you are in a position to change the landscape of a community. Uh, very similar to James, you start to see the impact that you can have you know, on a macro level and then even on a bigger level. Um, when you're serving communities that are underserved, that traditionally by big banks, they are turned away at the door and they cannot get along because they don't fit into the box that is you know, a conventional box. Um, that's how I, I started pushing into this industry. Finding my company, Altera Home Loans, was something that really drove me to say, you know what, uh, there's gonna come a point where we are no longer the underserved market, we are just the market. 
Uh, with my company last year, we did 80% of our loans to this market, right? And it's people that look like me, that speak like me, that have very similar experiences to me. And that's something that put me in a position where I decided, you know what, this is something that I'm enacting change within my community. And that's what drove me to it. And then, you know, you start to see, like, maybe I didn't, you know, get to go to the stars, but I see people, you know, that little glimmer in the eye when they do close on the house. Maybe I haven't discovered, you know, this cool fish, but, you know, I get that Christmas card from people that I have changed their lives, right? And maybe I'm not Superman, but in some people's eyes, when they've been turned away by three different banks and say that you're not going to be able to do it, you know, to them, I am Superman. Okay, so that's absolutely. something that I see. And, you know, that's something that we continue to push forward within my organization. Definitely. That's great. Really <coughs> moving forward. And one thing that you brought up is the new mainstream market. And I just want to highlight that for a second, because I was just in a meeting with people saying, you know, if you're not focused on young and diverse markets, you're going to be out of business in the next five years. Uh, according to the Joint Center for Housing Studies, 75% of household growth is coming from communities of color. Absolutely. And, uh, and you know, we know that one in three home purchases today are made by millennials, so, uh, which is a very diverse market. And so the underserved segments are, have to be a huge focus for companies. Uh, so, Jessica, what brought you into your role and explain a little bit about what you do? Well, I don't know if I can follow the Superman narrative. <laughs> so, I, I'm obviously on the other side of the house. I work uh, in the social sector. I work for an organization called Rebuilding Together, which is a national nonprofit, and I have been in the social sector all of my career, and I have always been in housing and community development. And for me, I really see... Um, when I sort of came into the workforce, I was very interested in not only how can I make a living, but how can I make a life, and how can I... Um, do work that not only pays my bills, but that I feel good about doing every day and I wake up and I'm like, yes, this is what I want to be doing and I can make a difference in people's lives. So I found an early commitment to the social sector through a fantastic program called AmeriCorps um, and I worked yeah. for a nonprofit um, home ownership program and I was um, actually underwriting and originating loans for um, very low income folks with 0% interest and 1% down um, and really found a commitment and a love for housing um, and really see the home as a platform for all sorts of successes for people. So without um, a solid roof over your head or a safe and healthy environment, no matter how good your schools are or how um, great of a cook you are, you're just not going to thrive. Um, and so that's how I came here. I mean, my everyday is really I'm on the uh, partnership development side of things for my organization. So I spend my days thinking about how can we creatively work with um, both public and private institutions to build collaborative partnerships that really um, fulfill both the philanthropic and community-based uh, mission of rebuilding together, but also meet the needs of uh, various uh, banking and corporate um, and government institutions. Awesome. Wow. That's great. Uh, so with it, well, I got to home for USA and just in the mortgage business in general, totally by accident, as all of us got <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> just doubled upon it because uh, I thought I was going to go into environmental science after failing biology. That didn't work out. <laughs> I thought the teacher couldn't grade, but that turned out just me. And um, and then I, I actually was a middle school teacher, and um, and being a middle school teacher, uh, it really taught me and strengthened my skills as a manager, a motivator. Um, and an organizer, you know, of my kids and, uh, and a change agent for them. So then I took, you know, kind of as the universe has it, things shift without you really trying to shift it. I thought I was just going to stay in teaching, but then uh, I ended up going to Home for USA. Home for USA was actually started 24 years ago by my parents, Jim and Marcia Griffin. So when things uh, kind of transitioned out as a teacher, I went to Home for USA um, to start a youth program which actually, once I got there, you know, and uh, just knowing what I knew from being a teacher, we had so many operational pieces that really needed to be tended to, just kind of as things naturally shift, I used really the skill set that I strengthened as a teacher, sure. parlayed that over to home free, not knowing anything about the mortgage space, and really went in head first to um, strengthen, reorganize, and restructure our infrastructure. So, and then now what's going on about eight years later, uh, we are at a much more organized place, at a much more effective place, um, at a much more operationalized place with a much stronger team, you know, 
company reorganization is a lot of work. <laughs> and to do it, not knowing what you're doing, and to do it kind of like just kind of uh, uh, along the way is a whole other situation. So that's my life, you know. So now, um, but in, in th through that weaving, I've always been a connector, always been a socialite, never have, or a socialite in my head. I've always been social. I can't say I'm a socialite. <laughs> I've always been social. I don't have the clout to be a socialite yet. But needless to say, I used a lot of those natural skill sets for the marketing, you know, and so it went to organizational restructuring to marketing and outreach and then through the marketing and outreach. Um, that's kind of where I have landed in title, but honestly, eight years later, that's what I'm actually doing on a day to day basis, as well as managing the company and just making sure that we are doing what we need to do today so that we can be alive 24 years from now. That's great. Love that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting when we look at today's marketing, what's really effective is understanding people and, and being authentic and connecting. So it makes sense that your skills would transfer very easily. Um, so I am really excited about this panel specifically because my background originally was social work and the nonprofit space. And then I realized that the that a lot of uh, what was effective for helping my clients with partnering nonprofits with businesses. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of the, the growth in marketing and, um, and seeing a, a lot more effective reaching of diverse segments and, and millennials as well. So I want to uh, dive in a little bit, starting with, the, with you guys, James and Jesus. Um, will you share a little bit about what your company is doing specifically to reach underserved markets? And uh, I know there's tons that you could share on, but maybe <laughs> few, pick a few highlights. James, we'll start with you. Um, I think you heard everybody at the table talk about education. You've got an educator. Right. You've got the person, who, uh, you know, uh, Jesus said this is a vocation. I think the driver and the opportunity is really creating education and awareness and promoting that in the communities that we serve. So when you look at ways to partner and uh, things that our organization at First Citizens, what we do and how we partner with some of the nonprofits, is really focused and driven around education. There are plenty of products and services and programs and uh, you know, outside of finding affordable housing, uh, most people still don't know they can, they can buy a house. And there's so many other myths and rumors and swirls around it. That is really the biggest uh, obstacle to overcome or the biggest opportunity that I see the underserved have to face. And so by putting together programs in partnership, by leading with education, and by promoting um, the knowledge that it can be done, really, it's how you do it. Uh, I think there's various ways, but it's still uh, grounded uh, in that educational premise, mm -hmm. whether it be putting on events, whether it be going to create um, partnerships with organizations and companies, um, there are various opportunities to leverage that. And typically we leverage it with community partners because it's the community partners that, that provide the validity mm -hmm. of what we're doing. A lot of times without them, we are a sales pitch. I work for a company, yeah. right. Jesus works for a company. Mm -hmm. They are here with the understanding of serving the community. We all are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you hear the passion in everything that we've said, but without them knowing us personally, it takes that stigma a way of it being a sales pitch when you have a, a community partner that is already has a reputation of really driving that awareness and then as a, as a lender we find ways to really leverage that uh, relationship mm -hmm. to promote uh, education around home ownership in those communities so that's that's yeah. really our strategy and particularly with lenders having a lot of distrust in in some of these markets mm -hmm. it's really helpful to build that credibility mm -hmm. and uh, and give you access to to more people, really. So, Jesus, what about you? So, um, what, it's a little bit of a two-part answer, right? So, um, it has to do with the reason why I went to Altera. Um, and the reason why I went to Altera was because when I walked in the doors, I felt like I was at home. Uh, the people that work with me, down to my processor, to my loan officer assistant, to my underwriter, um, chairman, my CEO, um, are all Hispanic. So that's something that is embedded into my organization. So I have the confidence that it's um, culturally understanding, right? That my borrowers know that um, the process is something where, you know, maybe there is um, a language barrier, right? Maybe there is a cultural barrier. But they have the confidence to know that because I speak Spanish, because my processors speak Spanish, right? That they will get their loan processed. They will get their loan underwritten. Right? And there will be someone that will advocate for them. 
So now knowing that, it creates this feeling of you know, family, this feeling of cultural understanding that you know, this company does have your best interests at heart because there are people who understand that you know, there are some obstacles that are gonna come up, but together we're gonna get through it, right? So this creates that. Um, I have underwriters who went through the process to become citizens because at some point they were undocumented. Mm -hmm. And we do loans for people who have ITIN numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that's great, you know, because that's a market of, that's a segment of the market that's so underserved, right? We have the borrowers who, you know, when DACA was still available, we were doing DACA loans. And then, you know, even, you know, when the administration said we're not doing, you know, or DACA doesn't exist anymore, you know, we fought tooth and nail to keep DACA alive, you know? So we were a resource to this community, right? So this is something that, you know, in our, you know, um, organization, we take very seriously. Uh, ben Slayton um, was the first African-American real, real estate agent when they said you couldn't be a realtor because you're African-American. Mm -hmm. He started a division called the Legacy Division to help empower African-Americans um, to be homeowners mm -hmm. because we understand that building wealth through homeownership creates generational wealth. It's not just something that, you know, I own a house now, and then it goes, this is something that gets embedded, and it creates this, you know, sense of ownership to understand that kids who grow up in the houses that they own are more likely to go to college, less likely to become single parents, mm -hmm. you know, and that creates this sense of ownership, for lack of better words, right? That's what I'm talking about when I tell you that, you know, our organization has this commitment to what we're trying to accomplish, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what we're doing that's unique, you know. I want our customers to walk in and know that, hey, we speak your language. We understand what you're going through, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and there are these little cultural nuances that, you know, make us laugh every day, right? Like, we tell people, you know, you know, where's your down payment? And they're like, oh, well, we have it. Well, where do you have it? <laughs> you know, in the bank. It's in the mattress. Right? Mm -hmm. So how do we document that, right? <laughs> right. Or they, it's a community pool of money that comes up, right? And we have the capacity to document that money because it is a viable source, right? Yeah. So that cultural understanding is the reason why. You yes. Know? So both Jesus and James have talked a lot about the education piece and how important that is to reaching new consumers, building that trust. Um, Jessica and Milan, can you guys speak to some of the education that you guys do as organizations? On. So we uh, do uh, education in a variety of different pockets. Uh, so we are a HUD intermediary and basically um, we uh, under HUD we are approved and we have uh, about 58 um, affiliates nationwide, um, other nonprofit housing counseling organizations. So our first pool of people that we educate are, are on the B2B side within our affiliate network, you know, helping nonprofit housing counseling organizations to really think like for-profit organizations, be more sure. social, uh, socially entrepreneurial, if you will, be social enterprises so that we can really help them to scale and grow their business and tap, to, tap into new revenue sources because it's just hard to stay alive at this point. The second group of people still on the um, business to business side are, is the mortgage industry, because while it comes through in more informal ways through um, edu educating the mortgage industry, but still educating them through even our Reaching Millions conference where we bring together mortgage leaders as well as our national um, affiliate network, educating the mortgage industry on how to better connect with people of color in general through our affiliate network, but also um, African Americans specifically through Home Free USA. Because uh, as we all know, and I think you really said this well, uh, that we as a the nonprofit world, we help to kind of humanize, if you will, the lending world and, um, and build your credibility. And so a lot of that then is us educating the mortgage lending spaces and companies about why partnering not only with nonprofits, but seeing nonprofits as a business partner just versus just a charity is really important to their bottom line. So it's a lot of education on the business to business side on our affiliate network, as well as the mortgage um, lending uh, world. We also work with realtors as well. And on the business to consumer side, Home for USA spends uh, our time educating home buyers, you know, helping them to understand not only how, what they need to do financially, um, credit and everything else to get mortgage ready, 
but also, and then thus approved, but also how to really sustain that home. Uh, and then, um, and, and because of that education and empowerment, we have a 0% foreclosure rate amongst yeah. the um, the 8,000 or so home buyers we've helped locally through our program. And it's been about 24,000 of home buyers we've helped through our network, but the foreclosure rate is for our local initiatives. And, uh, and so, and then we have a new opportunity that, a new initiative that we've started, it's called the Center for Financial Advancement. And so that's another uh, segment that we really educate, which is working with uh, students from select historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, uh, training them and teaching them how to be financially aware, how to build wealth, exposing them to home ownership at a much earlier age because you don't have to wait till you're, you know, settled down to buy a home anymore. You could you could do it straight out of college, you know. Yeah. Oh, you got to get some income first, of course. And so um, and so so our last group of, of those that we educate and really work with are college students, and I'm um, helping them to be more financially aware and also exposing them to the mortgage industry because we also uh, recruit from these HBCUs, HBCUs, and then we um, place them at partnering mortgage companies. You are so busy. I cannot believe <laughs> yeah, all yeah. of I knew about maybe half of those. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting because we're We have a small here. staff, so like, yeah, wow, busy yeah. and sleepy. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because we're seeing nonprofits need to act more like for-profit businesses, mm -hmm. and we're also seeing for-profit businesses, particularly lenders, needing to act more like nonprofits, you know, and get more involved in the community and build those relationships on that level. Um, Jessica, you do a really great job, your organization and you do a great job of helping to build those partnerships between corporate and nonprofits, nonprofit being yours, uh, rebuilding together. Will you talk a little bit about how you do that and how companies can kind of leverage that relationship to help build their brand? Sure. Um, I think the most important thing and what I really try to come to the work uh, from this perspective is like building an authentic and meaningful relationship that aligns from a both mission perspectives. Not nonprofits aren't the only folks with wish, with missions, and so I think that as we build these relationships, it's really about identifying sort of what is the community need, and how can you as a nonprofit and a corporate entity attack that together? Because we bring different um, skill sets to the table, and so um, specifically around sort of we focus a lot, I would say, sort of in the preservation anti gentrification space. We are um, singularly focused on like improving the physical environment of homeowners in their homes and in their communities and preserving sort of the historical integrity of these neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, but we can't do it alone. So if it's uh, a, a really great anecdote, and I, this might kind of sum it up, is we um, a lot of times we partner with corporations to fund those repairs, very simply. Um, but it can go beyond that, and it's simply about connecting the dots. So we were um, with a family in Long Island, New York, and it's a veteran, and it was Veterans Day, and it was also her birthday. And they were like, oh, and your project is funded by XYZ Bank. And she was like, oh, my gosh, they hold my mortgage, and I'm behind. And they were like, well, let's call them, you know? And they got on the phone with that same that, – that lender, that the, the philanthropic arm of the business had provided this grant, right? This, like, you think of it in a very separate – form like this philanthropy out to the community but it made the connection back to that homeowner that like I'm not alone in this and like let me pick up the phone and try to figure out how we can work this out and do the and, and do what needs to be done to keep me in my home and so if you can build authentic and meaningful relationships and if you can combine from like who you're investing in I mean it makes a lot of sense for banks to operate in the philanthropy space with housing organizations because there's fantastic opportunities for those magical moments that happen all the time and it's just yeah. exposing people to like the bank isn't this big bad industry and the company isn't this this faceless nameless entity you know there's a person on the other end of the line and if you can bring people into communities if you can bring your your lenders and your underwriters and the the folks that are making these decisions into communities to see what it yeah. is that people are are living in and, and how they're working you 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 connect on a different level i think from a mission perspective yeah definitely. Um, and so we're just interested in creating those authentic connections mm -hmm. And you do a great job of helping companies with t telling their story associated with the nonprofit. And I would love to hear from anyone, uh, but maybe starting with you, Jessica, how do you, how do companies tell the story publicly? Like a lot of people will give back mm -hmm. and have that philanthropic arm like you're talking about, but then no one knows about it really, mm -hmm. you know? So, so what is a good strategy or some tips around 
kind of telling the public that you're doing this good thing without looking like a jerk for talking about yourself. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to authenticity, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, if you are, I, I think, again, if you're, let me take a step back. I think the company has to, like, talk the talk and walk the walk on more than the philanthropy. Yeah. So if you're pushing out a philanthropic initiative, but if you're not doing what you need to do in terms of how you interact with your customer base, the philanthropy is not going to go anywhere. Yeah. So the philanthropy, I think, is an enhancement, a community enhancement. But, like, you as a, as a company need to really, like, show up in communities. And these communities are investing in you. They're, right. Maybe some of their money is under the mattress, but a lot of it's in the bank. And we're working to get sure. people, uh, underbanked folks, banking. And, you know, they're your customer base. So if you're not engaging with them in the appropriate way, and if you don't have those business, business practices that back up your philanthropy, I think you've got to address those business practices. But if your business practices are in place, I think shout that story of like additional community investment from the rooftops because you're already investing in communities by like showing up and, you know, being accessible yeah. and having staffs and lenders and underwriters that look like the community. You're already doing that. And this engagement is just going to enhance that storytelling. So, um, you know put a commercial on TV, yeah. you know, have somebody in the branch talking about, you know, the relationship that they have with you, with your bank. I think these are yeah. very, uh, you know, I think we're used to like dealing in the big banks and the big industries, but so much of this is relational. Yeah. And a lot of these underserved communities aren't doing all their stuff online. They're no. still mm -hmm. coming into the branch. Mm -hmm. So if you want to show them what you're doing, like put it in front of their face mm -hmm. and make it accessible to them. Yeah, I think Jesus is a great example of on the local level how you tell that story. Like he's advocating. It's all about advocacy mm -hmm. and, and bringing people to your cause. So if you're partnered with Rebuilding Together, you're saying join me in this cause and join me in, in mm -hmm. kind of furthering this initiative and, and rebuilding our communities right. together. Mm -hmm. On a corporate level, can you share a little bit about what your thoughts are on that? They are the same thoughts echoed. I think um, a couple of key things were said. Culturally, it's about trust. It's about mm -hmm. knowing your partner. It's about authenticity. Um, the word I would say corporately to really position your brand is not necessarily through a commercial. There are commercials, and again, it's a sales pitch. Sure. That's how it's viewed in the community, unless they know someone. Philanthropy, they give dollars, but the dollars that people don't see. They may hear about it on the news. It may not register. What they will know and will recognize is that banker that they see mm -hmm. right. consistently in their space. We can't do something one time and give one big check and then appear and then be gone. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they see you and they meet you that one time, they need to meet you two to three times. They need to see you. They need to get to know you. So if you really want to position and build a brand, that's one of the things uh, our, our focus is at First Citizens strategically, is to make sure that we are that person that they get to know. I think, especially when you're dealing in diverse markets, yeah. culturally, as I said, whether it's Hispanic, whether it's African American, whether it's Asian, whether it's Indian, um, everyone likes to know who they're working with, some yeah. more than others. That's what builds the trust. The only way to build the trust is to build a relationship. The only way to build the brand is to have the relationship. The only way to have the relationship is to consistently be there, be in the community, whether it be with our nonprofit partners, whether it be uh, in servicing our loans, whether it be working with them in language, out of language, whatever the, the method you had to build that relationship, that's really what uh, corporately, if you want to have a company mm -hmm. that's going to position a brand that will be respected and identified with by the community, has to be consistent and persistent uh, in being seen so in, the, in these markets. People personally show up in yes. these markets. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Well, and we're going to. Well, and to everybody's point um, and that's why the fusion I mean there's no silver bullet here but I definitely think the fusion from the vantage point that we're in from home, at home free USA the fusion and the partnership and the strategic business alignment between the nonprofit and the um, for-profit mortgage industry is so important because now if you're a smaller lender and um, I find that and this is totally a generalization based on my observation I find that the smaller lenders are a lot more nimble a lot more personable and they go out of their way a lot more to build community connections amongst the people and amongst the um, realtors and that kind of thing I find that the bigger lenders 
uh, and maybe it's just a corporate mammoth, aren't as uh, nimble in wanting to do that. You know, their heart is not as much. And I think the heart may be there, but the effort is not as much. And I'm talking about the people yeah. on the ground and really fusing those people relationships. And so there has to be really a mental shift, whether you're with a smaller lender, a bigger lender, and it does need to come from the top down that the loans, um, home buyers, home ownership is not a product it's an experience and in this experience you have to cultivate you know there is a chronic piece i know everybody's chasing money but folks don't want to deal with first-time home buyers mm -hmm. but they don't want to deal with first-time home buyers because they're trying to chase the dollar signs not realizing that first-time home buyer is a perfect mover buyer you know yeah. Yeah. And, and so you know or they don't necessarily want to connect with communities of color or because they're Debt load is higher. The credit, you know, it's all these different layers, which I do get logically, but it, it does need to be a uh, shift. I don't agree with it, but it does need to be a shift starting from the top, um, so companies really start to see folks in this 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 loan home buying experience, the mortgage the mortgage mm -hmm. process as an experience, not just as the dollar signs, because the dollar signs will come, mm -hmm. but it is a customer relationships. It is uh, really connecting with those nonprofits. And then fusing it into larger marketing efforts. But I definitely agree it needs to be an authentic approach throughout the whole company. So on a national level, how are you getting people to make moves like this? I mean, we we can see on a local level how that how he's developing relationships, but uh, how do you get people to show up? Nationally is nothing but moving a lot of local relationships. Mm -hmm. If you do enough, so in, in all of our markets, the concept and a lot of things that Hastings does, we try to focus on in each market. Yeah. So it's a national strategy, but the activity still happens locally in all the markets. You have a so, local strategy as well. Correct. Well, mm -hmm. it's a local strategy really is, is, is a derivative of a national strategy. So we would identify a home, uh, a home free mm -hmm. in a market or an organization locally mm -hmm. and we would have the loan officers ensure that they are again consistently seen and persistently known in that marketplace to showcase those type of opportunities in all communities yeah that's a local strategy but it's managed nationally yeah. uh, so that each market kind of has its own goals and objectives it's uh, flexible enough to be able to address the market's needs because no two markets are alike we talk about you know um, how different nonprofits have different focuses based off of the market needs. Uh, so in addition to that, we, we, we give them the ability to really adjust and adapt to the market locally, mm -hmm. and then again, managed as an overall national strategy. Mm -hmm. But the concepts and the things that we're sharing here uh, really are, are, are what's, uh, what's needed. Because you know, how do you build your brand? I'm a firm believer commercials are great. You know, they're kind of neat to hear and see on TV. But when you have the market telling your story for you, that's more impactful than any commercial you can provide. They are the commercials, and the only way they'll do that and provide that endorsement is if the relationship's in place. So, <clears throat> Jesus, you work specifically a lot in Pilsen, right? Correct. The, a community that's predominantly Hispanic in Chicago. And um, so can you talk a little bit about how you, you built a brand around Trust the Beard, which yes. <laughs> uh, we've, we've got a beard. <laughs> we know, we know it comes off. And you, <laughs> yeah, you've got that posted on all of your logos. You've done a great job of branding that. Uh, but a lot of that comes from your relationships, like building that trust in the community. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about some of the that process of, of building that brand and how you've connected with people physically, you know, through partnerships or relationships? Yeah. So uh, what I wanted my brand to do was to be a staple in my community so that people understood that it's, it's something that you can trust regardless of my industry, right? So it's just something there so that people can see it as a beacon, right? Um, the reason that my beard exists is because one of my aunts passed away from breast cancer and she was very close to me. She was someone that, you know, always told me, you know, don't let people tell you you can't do something. Always, you know, go after what you want to go after. When she passed away, there's an organization in Chicago called Edmonds Angels that has a subdivision that's called Beards for Breast Cancer. So when she passed, I wanted to find a way to honor her legacy, right, and create, you know, this brand. Um, so when that happened, right, we started getting a pretty decent following behind it and we started raising money for cancer. Um, awareness and then you know I just kept it um, and then it just happened that right <laughs> um, so what I did is that um, I started I grew up in Pilsen um, and I wanted to see my neighborhood change holistically 
I didn't want it just to be something that happened because it happens, right? Pilsen's located perfectly where it needs to be. There's hospitals, there's schools. It's, it's poised to do well, right? It has uh, expressways, hospitals, um, and the neighborhood's changing. Downtown is a few minutes away. So there are people who are gentrifying the community. And uh, it created this, this fear, right? There are people who are so afraid that, you know, the neighborhood's gonna get lost, culture's gonna get lost. So I wanted it to be a resource for my community to let people know gentrification only happens if you sell your home. Mm, that's, that's the truth. <laughs> right? So how can I be a resource? I have programs that you know, help underserved people. I can do lower credit scores than most conventional banks. So that's what I wanted to establish in my community, to let you know that if you walk into my door and you have a desire to buy a house, we're going to get you there, right? Yeah, we're going to find a way to get you there, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have the resource in the program. I align myself with the nonprofits, and the way that I did it is I live within walking distance of my branch, and that's the reason why I got there. So when I started coming to the branch, I started walking into the business, handing out my cards and letting them know that I'm here for you, right? The same thing I started praying with organizations such as CHIP, Meister Tutoring, and letting them know, like, if there's parents that want to understand what it is to own a home and how you can do it, come talk to me. We did a program um, where we did, it's called gentrification instead of gentrification. What gentrification means, like, the people mm -hmm. changing your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. this, this neighborhood's been a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood for about 100 years, and 80% of the people who live there rent. Mm -hmm. wow. And now they're concerned about being displaced, and, you know, we need to change that mentality of them to say, like, if you all pull it together, you know, we can, you know, enact this change. Um, I'm looking at other neighborhoods in Chicago that are changing. There's a neighborhood called Bronzeville. Uh, it's predominantly African-American. And what they did is they came together and said, we're not going to lose our neighborhood. They all got together and between a group of people, they all started buying land. And they said, you know, with us, you know, we'll rent to each other. And then when one of us is ready to buy again, we'll pull our money together and we're going to buy. And they've been saving their neighborhood. So this is the mentality that needs to change between, you know, the minority groups that exist to say, let's keep our neighborhoods the way we want them. Let's change our neighborhoods the way we want them. But these are things that are important, right? Yeah. And that's how I became a resource in my community. Good. If you advocate for the nonprofit or for community leaders or for an, an issue in your community, you're inviting people to join you in, in that initiative. And, and then those people will be advocates for you as well mm -hmm. and open the doors. So... Uh, I think there's a lot. Yeah. Can I just mention one yeah. um, other thing, which is it, it's also important as we um, talk about diversifying the mortgage industry, um, creating new home owners of color, uh, building the financial wherewithal of people of color, of millennials. It's also important to really start much earlier than we're starting sure. because you know the mortgage industry again just like everybody's story here at this table it was kind of like i fell oops i'm in the mortgage industry yeah. so if uh you know if we as an industry and this is why uh initiatives like the center for financial advancement um that home free usa has partnered with many major uh lenders throughout the country is so important because the mortgage industry is also not nurturing the um, home buyers of tomorrow. We are not bringing them into the industry. Um, you have the kind of financial services form firms that do that a lot. You see them on college campuses. They do heavy recruitment. They have a lot of heavy internships. But you know, so when you're talking about an industry that's literally dying, no offense to anybody who's on the older side of the industry, but it is a, it's an aging industry. I mean, we're talking about, I think the average age is like 53 or something like that, 56. So you're talking about a very old industry that has a lot of deep implications, not only in terms of the workforce, but paralleled in terms of the uh, consumer. You know, people don't want to do business with people who don't look like them, who don't speak the language, who don't understand the, the cultural um, nuances, you know, and, um, and who literally can't speak the language because you may have some corporate issues that compliance issues right. that are real that you have to like uh, uh, mm -hmm. abide by. So it is really important, yes, with the nonprofit partnerships, but really also in addition to build um, new home owners of color and to build the financial wherewithal of communities, we do need to start earlier. Yeah. And we do need to pull more of our resources and attention to um, exposing students to the mortgage industry, showing them the value of home, owner, home ownership very, very early, despite the fact that they may have student loans, and letting them know that help is there yeah. um, so that they can really get on the bandwagon early. Yeah, definitely. And I think while that is 
super important. Recruiting and, and building a younger, more diverse workforce is important. A lot of companies are hesitating and doing anything because they don't have that yet. Um, so I, I also want to mention that with the millennial generation, we're looking for companies that are giving back and involved in their communities. And so by going ahead and getting started, like working with nonprofits and community partners, you open channels to recruit people, you open channels for new business, and you're already being able to appeal better to a younger generation of consumers. And I think there can be kind of like a continuum, right? Like mm -hmm. if a... a I think a, a corporation is in a tough situation, right? Because you've got to do the business analysis and you've got to determine that there's like a market mm -hmm. yeah. for right. this. And so I think that nonprofits and businesses can work together to sort of like do that balancing act of, okay, we're not quite ready to like really go full speed ahead into this market, but our nonprofit partners are on the cutting edge of that. And then they sort of like groom this group that then you know, floats up into maybe like a more community-based bank. And, you know, I think that we can work together to do that. And I think um, going back to something that we were talking about with um, the authenticity thing, I think that engaging with those community organizations and as you're figuring out how you want to get into these communities and really understand them, like not just you can show up, but like being present. So being yeah. engaged in a really meaningful way with the organizations that you're partnering with and engaging with that client base. I think a lot of us um, who are professionals, maybe we come from various backgrounds, but like you get away from that and you live, you're now out in the suburbs or you're, you know, in, in you know, that part of town. And so it's like coming back into those communities and really being in them and being a part of that experience and then not having that philanthropy side be separate from the business. So have your philanthropy arm, but integrate that into the business side so that the people making the business decisions really understand as best that they can what's going on in communities that they may not be actively living in every day. Definitely, that's a really good point. Can I make a quick point? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the aspects that gets lost is, um, is empowerment, right? So mm -hmm. with, within my organization, I don't have to wait for my corporate leadership to give me direction to decide to be involved in my community. Mm. Um, and that's something that I've been empowered within my organization to make a decision to say, you know, I want to do an Earth Day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm involved in my community and I've looked for the highest need that my community has, mm -hmm. right? And it's because I walk the streets of my community. It's because I've been involved in my community, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it starts from the very top, right? And you look at what's going on because ownership in my company um, donates, right? So it's a good feeling to give back to your community, mm -hmm. right? So if your ownership, right, or if the leaders of in your organization are already giving back, right, um, they've empowered me, right? And, you know, I have a joke and I say, like, I'm just a loan officer with a title, right? And I really sincerely believe that. And it goes back to what we talked about, that I kind of fell into this industry. But now I've been blessed enough to have a little bit more than what I came in with. So I want to give that back. I want to pay that forward, right? My organization absolutely supports me. And they say, you know, we're with you 100% and we're going to go through it. But it comes from leadership. Mm -hmm. I see what they're doing and I want to emulate that because they've empowered me enough to say, you know, you're, an, you're a business owner. I participate in a profit and loss. And I want to give back to my community so that I can be a staple in my community. Yeah. I go out and I see what they're asking for. I participate in, you know, Neighborhood Watch. You know, I, I let kids, you know, walk in front of my branch. I decided that we we're going to put lights up so that when they're walking home from school, it's not dark. Right. So all these things that are going on, and I don't, I don't need to wait for, you know, my vice president to say, hey, be a community advocate. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do. Right. Yeah. And it stems from them being involved in their communities in their respective states. We have, you know, team members are in California that are, you know, we have one that she received an award for being a community advocate. Mm -hmm. Right. And she's in Fresno. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are the type of things that we have to look at. And I think it does stem from leadership to emulate people that are in that have that capacity to be philanthropists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And now we want to do it as well. I think all of you have really touched on this <coughs> overarching leadership and strategy, but then empowering the local markets. And mm -hmm. so, you right. know, while you have that, this giving back program, it really comes down to individual authentic relationships and how, as an organization, do you empower individuals to do that? So I, we could talk forever, but I want to <laughs> close this by, I don't, I don't want us to leave without companies knowing how to partner with you guys as nonprofits. So 
could you share just briefly how a company would partner with you and how, how they could be involved with you on a local or national level? Sure. Uh, so Home Free USA, we have a variety of different um, programs that I mentioned, but you can learn all about the various ways that we can partner together um, at homefreeusa.org. That's H-O-M-E-F-R-E-E-U-S-A dot O-R-G. Um, and again, our, our major um, partners are uh, many of the top mortgage lenders, top being national, regional, local, all the above, you know, small, medium, and large. But everyone who is invested in doing work in the community, we are here as a business partner to help you to reach and connect with communities nationally and locally in the D.C. metro area through our affiliate network and through Home for USA. Great. Thank you. Jessica. Yeah, the same. <laughs> Just go to rebuildingtogether.org. But I think, again, we are, um, we're interested in getting people um, out in communities and meeting the needs of directly uh, of homeowners and then for of entire communities. So we like to say that we're super nimble and we'll build partnership strategies that work um, to meet everybody's needs, but we are particularly interested in um, providing those direct repairs to help people stay in their homes um, and ensure that they're safe and healthy and ensure that their communities are vibrant, um, uh, exciting places to live. Um, and we are exploring different partnership strategies around we how we can also uplift workforce development strategies so that people can not only have safe places to live, but access to good jobs, um, uh, some work around food insecurity as well through through community gardens and other community services. Um, and then always, always, always thinking about how we crack the nut of like, how do you really get people to understand taking care of their house? You know, like you're in it and you've got it, but like you need to protect that investment. It's the largest investment that you're going to make. And how can we collaboratively work together to really share that mission and share practical tools and tips and resources for how people can um, maintain their homes so that they don't need rebuilding together services. But again, uh, really open to lots of opportunities and rebuildingtogether.org is the best place to go. Great. Thank you so much. And I, I think both of your organizations actually provide comprehensive education paired mm -hmm. together. So I definitely encourage everyone to, to check them out. You guys, I think, would both benefit from working with them <laughs> if you don't already. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out, too, is that working with nonprofits allows you to better understand the needs of your community as well. Absolutely. I've reached out to executive director of your organization in Dallas uh, one time just because I wanted to better understand what the needs were mm -hmm. in the Dallas community. So that's... People are more connected in nonprofits, I think, to mm -hmm. a lot of underserved markets, and that can be a great resource as well. So mm -hmm. yeah. for you guys to close up, I would like to, if you could share just one or two points uh, that you would recommend to a company that is wanting to reach underserved markets or communities uh, through nonprofit relationships, and if you could just share a couple tips before we close. Uh, mine will be summarizing the entire conversation. Uh, I think we talked about commitment from the organization top down as well as effort, consistency, and persistency from, the, from bottom up. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to be successful in this space, you have to have support from an executive level yep. to show that the bank is behind it, but, most, but you also can't just live with writing checks. Mm -hmm. You've got to build the relationships in the community, and that takes uh, your loan officers in the, at a local level to identify partners such as this and to be present mm -hmm. uh, and to be committed. Uh, you, hear, you heard per se earlier that there, where one chases a dollar. That, that part is true, mm -hmm. um, the way that the industry is. However, there are com if you are truly committed, there are some committed individuals. I know within my organization, and I'm sure not just my organization, but every bank has them, that are committed to the community. And to do that, they've got to be present. So um, my tip would be commitment and uh, consistency. You can't yeah. just show up once. you got to be there. That is so key. I can't tell you how many lenders I've worked with that uh, they want to go in and see results immediately, and it mm -hmm. takes time. Yeah. It mm -hmm. takes consistency. So, mm -hmm. Jesus, what about you? I think we talked about it. It's uh, the authenticity behind it. So we touched a little bit about like that commercial, right? And I think you have to understand why you're doing it. Right? Like, um, when I showcase the stuff that we do, it's not because I'm looking for like that thumbs up, the Facebook like. It's more because I want to let people know that, you, you know, I'm a resource. Like, it's, you know, touching on James's topic, it's boots on the ground, right? And giving someone an opportunity, right? When I worked at a bank, I was uh, in a tough position because they threw a, a, a guidebook at me and said, you know, you can't have a beard. You have to be clean shaven. <laughs> wow. Right? And that's I don't, like the one thing you need. That's, <laughs> all, that's the whole thing. <laughs> and, sorry to say, you know, I'm not at that bank and, you know, I've been, you know, top producer, you know, I've been on different panels now and 
that bank's now trying to recruit me, and unfortunately, mm-hmm. I will not be going to that bank. Because you have the same guy, bro. Right? <laughs> so that's the thing, right? Like, don't let the appearance of someone be something that skews your reason why you don't hire them. Get to know somebody, because I grew up in a neighborhood that's predominantly Hispanic, and now I am making an impact in my community, right? And because I had facial hair is a reason why that bank didn't get to benefit from the change that I'm making in my community. Mm-hmm. So don't let that be a part of the reason why. Like, give someone an opportunity that's local to your market. Yeah. Find someone that understands your community, you know, because that person could be the reason why, you know, you have the authenticity that you're looking for, mm-hmm. the roots that you're looking for, right? Yeah. And the, the network that's in your community. Absolutely. That's what you need. And that is found through recruitment and through partnerships within the community. So. Absolutely right. I volunteered at nonprofits my whole life. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. This is a really interesting and productive conversation. And I look forward to staying in touch with you guys and hearing more from your work. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Mm-hmm.